Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. At the beginning of this week's parsha, by Yakel, we might find ourselves really pulled up short by the second verse in the parsha. On six days, work may be done, but on the seventh day, you shall have a Shabbat of complete rest, holy to the Lord. Sounds pretty good so far. But the verse ends, whoever does any work on it shall be put to death. <laughs> pretty harsh. The Israelites tried that at least once and found that, thankfully, they really did not have the stomach to be putting people to death for violating Shabbat. That was interpreted differently over the many years, uh, very beautifully, uh, to suggest that if we don't have a kind of Shabbat, some sort of rest, we're actually kind of doing ourselves in, in a way. Can't be all work and no rest. We all know how important that is. So to actually work ourselves to death, well, there might be something more in that verse than we might have at least, or at least first thought. Another beautiful interpretation is that on Shabbat, this mystical notion that we have an extra soul on Shabbat. And so to not have a Shabbat is to not accept the gift of that extra soul. It's like sort of killing a part of ourselves. So there's maybe a little more to think about there than we might have initially thought. What kind of life do we give to ourselves on Shabbat? For that, I think we have to look to the next verse. The next verse says, Lo teva'aru esh bechol moshvotechem biyom hashabbat. You shall kindle no fire throughout your settlements on the Sabbath day. Simple, straightforward, I think not. In January of 1998, I was really blessed to get a life-changing job helping almost always 12-year-olds prepare for their bar and bat mitzvah celebrations, which even I can do this math, means that the first ones are nearing 40 years old, which is truly surreal. But I digress. Amazing to me. In those halcyon days of the late 90s, and still today, believe it or not, my hand to God, a family occasionally will ask sort of early in the bar mitzvah process, what is the best way to prepare Josh or little Sarah or little Parker for their big day? It's a wonderful question. Always lets me know that that family's gonna be just fine since they're on it and wanting to do whatever they can to get everyone on the same page to celebrate that incredible bar bat mitzvah. But my answer in the 90s and my answer in 2024 that I just gave two weeks ago is always the same. Take a box of Shabbat candles, light two of them every Friday night as often as you can, and stand together quietly for a long minute Make the traditional prayer, give each other a hug and a few words of blessing, put whatever happened during the week aside for just a minute, take a deep breath, wish each other a Shabbat Shalom, and go on with your evening. And I won't ask what you do with the rest of the evening. It costs pennies. And we can't say that about too much in organized or even disorganized Jewish life. It's pretty expensive. But Shabbat candles amortized throughout the box really cost pennies. And the rewards are priceless. That's it, I tell the families. The rest, we'll learn together. Shabbat candle lighting transforms. It centers us, it filters out the unrelenting noise and stress of the modern world. And it's pretty overwhelming. And it has the power to change our minds, even for a moment. 
As a Jewish home ritual, nothing is simpler and, in my opinion, more effective for creating a sense of peace and connection to this people and its traditions for Jews of all ages. But it wasn't until a Friday evening in the early 2000s that I stopped in the middle of the blessing and actually listened for the first time to the words of that blessing I had taken for granted since childhood. Baruch ata Hashem Elokeinu Melech HaOlam, Blessed is the Holy One, the Eternal, Sovereign of the Universe. Asher kidishanu b'mitzvotav v'tzivanu al lahadlik ner shel Shabbat. Blessed is the one that gave us holiness through mitzvot and commanded us to kindle the light of Shabbat. Wait a second, I said. Where is that mitzvah in the Torah? Not to mention the Hanukkah candles, which have the same blessing and which are even less mentioned in the Torah, which is to say not at all. I knew about the big commandments to rest on Shabbat and at that time, quarter century ago, I knew a little about the very specific prohibitions against Shabbat work that grew in scope and detail over centuries. I had an inkling of what the Talmud was and was pretty sure that some of those things were spelled out in there. I had a long way to go. But those restrictions are based partly on this controversial verse in Vayakal. You shall kindle no fire throughout your settlements on the Shabbat day. So if kindling fire on Shabbat is prohibited, why do we make such a point of not only lighting candles to welcome Shabbat, but also of making a blessing of holy obligation before it? Odd. Well, as it turns out, Jews have been lighting Shabbat candles for millennia, though the blessing appeared much, much later. It was such a widespread practice that the rabbis of the Talmud took it as a given. They devote their discussion not to whether to light candles before Shabbat, but how, when, where, and with what materials the Shabbat lights should be offered. Shabbat has always been connected intimately to oneg, to joy, and the irresistible romance of the candles, let's face it, contributes greatly to that needed and welcome sweetness and delight. But lighting Shabbat candles was so common in Jewish culture that by the time of the Roman Empire, certain officials found the practice intolerable, an untenable poke in the eye of the ruling authorities. How dare the Jews of the Roman Empire sit idle for one-seventh of their lives and dare to be so public about it? The Roman philosopher Seneca railed against the dancing Shabbat lights as a pernicious and upsetting display of support for that era's brand of Judaism, which was spreading fast and wide, it should only be. I learned that in Rabbi Ismar Shorsh's wonderful essay, The Meaning of the Shabbat Candles. But the ritual, despite the dudgeon of the Roman officials, could not be extinguished. Despite its ubiquity and antiquity, though, the earliest known references to the blessing, that it's a mitzvah, a commandment, doesn't appear until the first official prayer book, the first Sidor, that of Rav Amram Gaon in the ninth century of the Common Era, pretty recently by Jewish historical standards. By then, the practice had assumed the status of law, of mitzvah, of commandment. But why? As with most things Jewish, it was a result of a passionate dispute over the meaning of this verse. In the Middle Ages, sects of Judaism sparred over how to interpret this and many other Torah-based rules. The so-called Rabbinites based their system of Jewish living on centuries of debates among the rabbis of the Talmud. They accepted Shabbat candle lighting as a sacred obligation. Without it, they said Jewish homes would be bereft of joy at exactly the moment joy was most required. But the Karaites, take their name from the word to read, read and practiced the Torah in a much more literal sense. Only a very few Karaite synagogues in the world, and one of them is just down the way in Daly City. They saw the ritual of Lichtbenchen, 
later term for it, but blessing of the light as a direct violation of this commandment to kindle no fire on Shabbat. Kindling and burning were given equal weight, so it is said that Karaite homesteads in the Middle Ages went utterly dark and cold on Friday at sundown through to Saturday night. No candle lighting, certainly no blessing, no hot food, and no other kinds of warmth that are associated with Shabbat commands. The heads of the primary Jewish academies of the Middle Ages were known as the Geonim, of which Rav Amram Gaon was among the greatest, who wrote the first prayer book. Uh, they endorsed the authority of the Talmud and its countless interpretations, innovations, and creations. Shabbat candlelighting was not only good, they decided, and completely in the spirit of creating joy on Shabbat, but the practice, they said, shall be enshrined in Jewish life, raised to the level of mitzvah, commandment, that its accompanying blessing conveys. And almost all Jewish communities have followed that ruling and maintain it to this very day. It takes just a few moments each week to transform our world, to transform our lives, to transform the soul. In the flickering warmth of the Shabbat candles, we are reminded once again of the fascinating tapestry of Jewish creativity and debate, woven over centuries of argument, discussion, and consensus. It's a little ritual that has the power to change the world, starting with each Jewish home, everywhere that the spark of those candles still burns as we search for, and please God, illuminate the path to peace. Shabbat Shalom.